Hey everybody, it's Nathaniel Avila, and I'm here with Noisy Ru uh, Ruby Rodriguez, also from Dallas County. <laughs> what did you call me? <laughs> with the with the back with the with the room tone. Can you you can hear stuff? No, that's it's okay. It, it kind of reduced itself. Oh. Pretty good. All right. Okay. So... <laughs> I was like, what can you hear? There's nothing going on. I have the windows open, okay. maybe. <laughs> So, uh, we're going to be continuing our journey through uh, Mexican-American history. Uh, right now, the last time we saw our heroes, we, we just finished World War I. Uh, David Barkley uh, got the Medal of Honor. Uh, who else? Uh, Marcelio, uh, yeah, Marcelino Cerna got uh, the String of Service Cross, and he was like the most decorated uh, soldier out of uh, Texas and now that the World War One is over we can see just ju things are just looking up for us am I right Ruby no <laughs> <laughs> from what I remember as soon as they were done with the war and they were fully decorated it was like it didn't even matter afterwards they were just going back to be treated like shit oh well, it's kind of like what happened in the Civil War Mm. Pretty right. spot on. Yeah. So we're gonna go into the 1920s. Uh, yes. Now, before Nate goes into the 1920s in America, yeah. I just wanted to say what's going on in Mexico in the 1920s. Blame. Um. So last we heard, Obregón was over the government, right? So, mm. um, it takes the U.S. a while three years to be exact, to recognize the Obregón government. And the only reason why they do is because the Mexican government promises that um, they're not going to seize the holdings of American oil companies in Mexico. Of course, it always has to do with oil, right? Oil and money. Um, so, but during the Obregón government, a lot of good things happened. Um, there was agrarian reforms, you know, meaning the redistribution, redistribution of land. Um, he also gave official sanction to organizations of peasants and laborers. There is also an educational reform that is led by Jose Vasconcelos. This leads to the Mexican culture revolution, which includes astonishing works of arts like um, works of arts from Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, uh, the photographer Tina Modotti, the composer Carlos Chavez, and the writers Martin Luis Guzman and Juan Rulfo. Um, so like, basically there's like an era that's like blossoming, right? Like Mexico is healing yeah, I think and I've, we get these. Yeah, I think I've read some of Luis Guzman's uh work i just don't remember what they were Guz oh i definitely have to pull some of that up then huh yeah whenever you get a chance I know. um yeah. what happened next so then in 1924 obregon steps down um because another general takes over uh plutarco calles is the name of the general that takes over for a short time because back again in 1928 Obregón is reelected, but it's very shortly lived during that term because he's killed in that same year by a religious, a religious fanatic. Mm -hmm. Good old religious fanatics. Um, so yeah, that's what happens in the 1920s in Mexico. Very interesting. During so that time. right now, so they're having kind of like a renaissance kind of like thing. Right. Kind of like thing. I mean, there's still a lot of work that's being put out that talks about the um, inequalities in the systems and stuff like that. But there's a bunch of, I guess, how do I say, freedom somewhat because they're actually able to put stuff out like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very educational. People are gaining more knowledge in that time period. All right. So, okay, so meanwhile in America, things aren't really going super well. Um, I see you rolling your eyes. What a surprise. Eyes. <laughs> what a surprise. So, in the years after World War II, the rising tide of nativism continued to grow in the 1920s, and then the blockbuster release of The Birth of a Nation came out, which was a virulent... Blockbuster. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> 
It's funny you say blockbuster. Why? Because like that didn't even exist at all. This was actually the very first That's blockbuster him. ever made. Um, this came out in. Uh, it actually came out in 1915, uh, and it made a whole bunch of money. But it was insanely racist, like super racist. Uh, so it actually, uh, so the United States saw millions join the Ku Klux Klan. So a terror, which is a terrorist organization which had been largely dominant since the end of the Reconstruction era in the 1970s. So this new iteration of the KKK was viciously anti-Catholic and anti-immigrant. And believed all Mexicans and Mexican Americans were subhuman foreigners. What do you think about that, Ruby? I would not. I would like to keep my comments to myself. Really? For legal purposes. This is this is this is the KKK. No one cares if you say anything bad about them. Mm, no, for legal purposes, I will. I will be quiet. Okay. So, the KKK wildly held that there was a vast global conspiracy seeking to subvert the U.S. sovereignty and install, and install Pope Pius XI as leader of the country. <laughs> so, believing Mexicans and Mexican-Americans were part of this, this conspiracy, the KKK mounted an extensive campaign of violence across the Southwest. So, the KKK had a strong presence in Texas and California. The organization had adherents in rural communities in both states and held major political control in large cities. In Dallas, where the KKK gained control over the city's politics, it sought completely close it com sought to completely close off the border with Mexico. So, what do you think about that that the KKK infiltrated the Dallas politics where we live? Bro, Literally, everybody needs to hear that. Like, someone should plaster that everywhere. Do mm. you know that the KKK was literally in charge of our politics in this city that we live in today? Mm -hmm. And you're going to tell me that there was no effect? Effect of what? Like, there's there's going to be an effect of that. I mean, there's, mm. that's the cause, and there's definitely always going to be an effect to a cause. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, that's just logic. Yeah. So meanwhile, in San Diego, the KKK was led by many of the city's elite, according to Ernesto uh, Gal uh, Galarza, a labor activist and professor. Uh, Mexicans were seen as an endangerment to traditional American values. Even the clergy often ignored the Klan's abuses toward Hispanics. So the KKK... The clergy never do shit. <laughs> It never told me, it doesn't say which clergy, though. It could be any clergy. So the KKK in Southern California regularly lynched, tortured, dragged, and murdered Mexicans and Mexican-Americans. Mercedes Acosta Garcia, uh, a refugee of the revolution, working as a maid in San Diego in the 1920s, stated, since they were ragged... Uh, okay. <clears throat> they, they say a slur in this. Uh... Since they were ragged, and then it's a slur for Mexican-Americans, uh, nobody cared who they were and nothing was done about it. So the KKK, who was also extremely politically powerful in Los Angeles, and in 1928, the KKK senior member, John Clinton Porter, was elected mayor of the city. Oh, Lord. So what do you think that a member of a, a, an actual Klansman became the mayor of Los Angeles in 1928? I think that we barely avoided another Holocaust situation happening here in the U.S. Because if you're telling me the KKK was taking over Dallas and then the KKK was taking over California, those are very, very two big states in the United States. And was to say that it couldn't happen across the board. Mm hmm. And then knowing what their ideals are and their morals and values are, I have no doubt in my mind that it could have gotten there. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that the, the Klan is very, very prominent here in Dallas still. I think they still have, like, branches here. What do you think? Why? I don't know. I, don't, I, like it, I think that is one of the things that will always surprise me. How are you so willing to announce how much of a bad and stupid person you are? 
like they're they're <laughs> constitutionally protected. There's nothing we can do about it. I'm I'm sure there's nothing we can do about it. I mean, now I hope that there's changes in the future about that. But like I'm saying, like it just really surprises me how these people are so willfully like able to just show the whole world or tell everyone I'm a bad dumbass person. Well, they kind of <laughs> yeah. Well, they also kind of don't because they wear masks too. And they wear masks in order to protect their identity. And and even more, yeah, even more so. If if you're if it's not something that you can do bare face to show the world, you know, like you know something's wrong. Who else fucking covers their face when they're doing something? Of criminals, they're committing crimes because they don't want their faces to be seen. Mm-hmm. And and then you literally like are doing the exact thing and being a big ass fucking hypocrite. At least that, like, at least you know that people know you're being a hypocrite. Right. I hope you at least know that. <laughs> yeah, have you ever seen the movie uh, Black Klansman by Spike Lee? I have, and I loved it. It's a, it's I a love really it, good Because it just shows how fucking stupid those people are, <laughs> even more so. <laughs> yeah, to have like a, an African American. Oh, uh, and that guy them. that played the clan member, what was his name? Uh, what was his name? Oh, uh, I cannot remember his name right now. The one that played the 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 leader. Oh, the clown. Oh. He was just. Was the, it Topher Grace? I think maybe. Who was it? Was um, who he played the the Grand Wizard or something? Yeah, or something like that. Black clan. But it's just so funny how he's just like so gullible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is Topher Grace. <laughs> it is Topher Grace. The definitely good. Yeah. Don't and, go watch that movie if you haven't because it's so good. Mm-hmm. And he was a Trump supporter. Just saying. Who, Topher Grace? No, not Topher Grace. The guy he played, David Duke. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And then they were pulling up all these pictures with Biden. What about that, Biden? That Biden, had, that Biden had taken a picture with that grand wizard guy or whatever. Mm. But uh, it's like, but he was a Trump supporter. That doesn't make any sense. Why would he hang out with I know. an Irish Catholic? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> makes no sense. So anyway, so like the Colorado, Colorado was another may, uh, area with an extensive clan activity. So during World War One, Colorado companies sought to fill labor gaps left by soldiers through recruiting refugees of Amer- of the Mexican Revolution, who had arrived in the U.S. in large numbers during the 1910s. Uh, as labor recruiters paid to relocate large numbers of refugees to Colorado, white residents became increasingly enraged at the presence of the racial aliens. So, during the first Red Scare of the 1920s, significant numbers of white Coloradans joined nativist and 100% American organizations. 100% American is in quotes, by the way. So, despite these sentiments... Uh, corporations continued to recruit Mexicans in 1921. So John Galen Locke her, uh, harnessed the intensifying anti-Mexican feelings and organized the KKK in Colorado. So by 1925, the KKK had emerged as a dominant political force in Colorado, running in campaigns of law and order and anti-Mexicanism. The KKK deliberately held rallies in cities with large Mexican neighborhoods. So what do you think about that? I think it's starting. The takeover is starting. Mm-hmm. There was this, trying to go all over. Yeah. There was this very oh. famous uh, KKK rally that happened in Washington, D.C. Uh, do you remember like that? The, the photos and stuff of that? I believe they showed a couple of them uh, in recent years. Um, when when did it take place? Like during this time? I think it was in nineteen sixties. I mean, I could have. I just don't remember. Okay. There's so many pictures that I've seen of bad shit happening that I can't really pinpoint them all. Yeah. Oh, here it is. I have a photo of it right now. So um, it actually took place in the nineteen twenties. That's what I was referring to. So here's a photo of it. Um. Here it is. Can you see it? Yeah, they're showing their faces here, huh? Yeah. So, 
what so what what are we seeing can make we... it big screen make it full screen okay so can you explain to me what we're seeing right now Uh, yeah, so there's basically what looks like a parade. It's a black and white photo, and it looks like people are lined up or sitting down on both sides of the streets, you know, like you would in a parade. There's a lot of people, and you see nothing but white, white hoods, white gowns white even the women are wearing white pantyhose and white shoes white high heels um i guess i wouldn't call them high heels they're like those small kind of Mm. either way they're heels i would not be walking in that (laughs) (laughs) and they have these capes around them um that are weirdly not white i would assume they would have that they have they are holding the american flag Several of them are holding the American flag in mm-hmm. the parade, and they're literally just walking. Is that is that what they would do during the parade? Just walk like that's yeah. what we came here to see. Just a bunch of y'all walking. Yeah, it's it's just like a regular <laughs> rally. It's just a regular. You know how in uh... um, rally, I would compare this to those that were rallying for Trump when they said that the election had been lost. Yeah, it's it's, or, it's sorry, it's, stolen. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's exactly what Their it says. Terms. And uh, what what can you see in the background here? Oh, the Capitol. Yeah. So the Capitol is in the very back. Um, I could barely see it because it's white. Um, I blended it into the sky a little bit, but yeah, it's at the very end. So yeah. So yeah. So this is supposed to like show like how powerful these guys were, right? So yeah. So that's pretty much. A little bit of a scare tactic, maybe, you think? Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Because they would do it in Mexican neighborhoods. Would you be scared, Ruby? Hell yeah. The hell? If I know, if knowing what these people stand for and they're in my neighborhood, like, yes. Mm. I would definitely be scared. I'd be like, let's get the out of here mm-hmm. but the thing is they're still here they're, they're in this city right now yeah let them try to hold a rally like that I fucking dare them <laughs> oh, I fucking snap. dare them so you're not scared anymore I think we're past the point of being scared at this point mm. at that point back then in the 20s you know everything's new and you don't really know much of America, you know, you just came from Mexico and you're just trying to make a living and trying to work and these people are here and you hear about what they've been doing and of course you're going to be scared, right? Mm -hmm. Now, now we are just fed up, like to the point where it's like, I'm not taking anything anymore Mm -hmm. because it's gone to that point. Yeah. So And they've pushed us there. Mm -hmm. They really have. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's pretty much all we we'll talk about the clan for for this, and we'll move on to the next part, uh, which is in the years following World War One, the United States nearly shut out immigration from the rest of the world. In 1921, Congress passed the Emergency Quota Act of 1921, which set immigration levels to three percent of the number of foreign-born persons in each nationality. Living in the U.S. as determined by the 1910 United States Census. So this act was meant to reserve most immigration quota slots to the northwestern European countries, which received the largest number of the 350,000 total slots created. So immigration restrictionists, however, were not satisfied, and U.S. Representative Albert Johnson and Senator David Reed responded by pushing in even stricter quotas. The resulting Johnson-Reed Act reduced the quota from 3% to 2% and changed the census date base from 1910 to 1890, which meant that only people from the West and North Europe could immigrate. So, yeah. What do you think of that? You're muted. That's pretty specific from only those countries. Mm -hmm. So for Mexicans, however, the effect of the law was complicated. 
as the quota system applied only to countries outside the Western Hemisphere. So meaning that there were no caps on immigration from any Latin American country. So this lack of quota for Mexicans was controversial amongst the U.S. nativist uh, movement, who were outraged at the number, at the large number of Mexican immigrants entering the country, including thousands during the Cristero War. So immigration uh, restrictionists were desired to limit the number of non-white people in the U.S. Felt that immigration from Mexico went even when only to fear labor gaps was dangerous to the nation. Do you agree with that? Did they explain why it was dangerous to the nation? Uh, because they're not white. That's the only reason. Just, I don't know. So. I don't know. Yeah. It's... So one article of the Saturday Evening Post asked, how much longer are we going to defer putting the Mexican Indian under the quota law, which we have established for Europe. So the East Texas Congressman John C. Box went so far to state that Mexicans would lead to the marginalization of white America. So here we go again with, with this, with this, I don't want to be replaced thing. So, in general, however, Mexican racial identity with continuous, was continuous enough for lawmakers to avoid moving forward with increased restrictions. U.S. Secretary of Labor J, uh, James Davis wrote, The Mexican people are of, which, of such mixed stock and, and individuals... Oh, in general, however, Mexican racial identity was continuous... Okay, I, I went all over the place. <clears throat> Let me start over again. U.S. Secretary, that out. Okay. U.S. Secretary of Labor James Davis wrote, The Mexican people were of such mixed stock and individuals have such a limited knowledge of their racial composition that it would be impossible for most learned and experienced ethnologists or anthropologists to classify or determine their racial origin, thus making an effort to exclude them from admission of, or citizenship because of their racial status is practically impossible. So according to scholars of the period, however, most Americans at the time believed Mexicans' racial heritage was impure. So what do you think about that? Impure? Why? Um, because they're just not because white? Just because maybe, maybe they're, just because they're not white? Yeah. And, and you just get to call somebody impure like that without any explanation as to why they're impure? Yeah. And also, what do you think about that whole thing? Where They'll tell like, me they're going to pull out the... Witchcraft! Witches! Witchcraft! Okay. We get to hang them. Yeah. So, like, also, like, what do you think about that whole, like, um, they're like, we need to exclude Mexicans, but then they're like, we can't really do that because it's kind of impossible to determine if you're a Mexican or not. Right, because they said that there was so many, like, I guess that had, um, mixed racial backgrounds, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. That it'd be hard for them to be... So, so specific. Yeah. Yeah. So even though Mexican immigration was never subjected to quota, lim quota limits, U.S. immigration officials used increasingly sturgent measures to limit entry. So four in, uh, in, uh, internet, <clears throat> for initiant laborers who lived in Mexico and worked in the United States, weekly disinfection mandates were regularized and quarantine and bath certificates were required to be renewed weekly. Okay, and did anybody make a fuss about that? No, but now you ask somebody to wear a mask and fucking flip out. They will lose their minds. And too. only because, it, and they were probably fine with it because it was only the Mexicans that were subjected to doing that. Mm -hmm. I think I know right. some people who need some bath certificates. <laughs> it's you. There are some people here in the U.S. that really need a, dis a good old disinfecting. <laughs> so then in 1924, the U.S. Congress approved the creation of the Border Patrol, led by previous chief Chinese inspector Clifford Allen Perkins. So the Border Patrol began with headquarters in El Paso, overseeing three district offices in Los Angeles, El Paso, and San Antonio. 
So beginning in the 1920s, visa controls and deportations became regular mechanisms to regulate Mexican immigration. Finally, in 1929, Congress passed the Aliens Act of 1929, known as Blease's Law, which turned undocumented entry into the United States a misdemeanor and re-entry a felony. Up to that point, immigration violations were largely considered civil matters. So now it's 100% against the law now. All because they were scared that the Mexicans were too many. Yeah, because they didn't want to... Uh, they were afraid to of being replaced. Quote, unquote. So, yeah. So now in the 1920s, Mexican entertainers entered Me American popular culture for the first time in U.S. history. So, Dolores Del Rio was an actress, singer, dancer, born and raised in Mexico. She and her husband left Mexico in 1925... Both were from upper-class families who were struggling in the aftermath of the Mexican Revolution. So she began her film career in Hollywood. Da, 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 Hollywood. Am I right, Ruby? Yeah. Yeah, Hollywood. So almost immediately upon her arrival. So now Hollywood is here. And Hollywood is here to stay. And what are and we're gonna and, sh, and now we have this Dolores Del Rio is gonna implement the Mexican footprint in Hollywood. So, uh, <coughs> so she had roles on starring in successful silent films, including Resurrection, Ramona, and Evangeline. While Del Rio was proud and insistent of her Mexican heritage, she was nevertheless mostly cast in white roles, especially appearing in romantic interest with white actors. Many considered her the most beautiful woman in the world in the 1920s and early 1930s, and she was widely regarded as the first major female Latin American star in Hollywood. So what do you think about Let's that? Let's see a picture. You want to see a picture? Yes. Yeah, she is very I beautiful. I want to see who my inspiration is to get to Hollywood. Okay. <laughs> There she is. She paved the way. Look at her. She's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. She is gorgeous. So can you tell us what we are seeing here? We are seeing a picture of um, Maria, right? Maria del Rio? Dolores del Rio. Sorry, Dolores <laughs> del Rio. And she is, it's a black and white photo, yeah. but she's wearing a white crochet looking gown. And also, she has a white, um, what do you call that? It goes over your head. I, I don't really 100% remember, but I know that's a really popular headgear in, in Mexico and Latin America. In countries. Mexico, yeah. You know, just wearing over your, like, I guess it's kind of like a, a robe, but like for your head. You just yeah. put it, place it on your head and yeah. it drapes all the way down. And she has gorgeous brown locks of hair. And she, it looks like she has really thick hair because she has um, her hair parted in two braids. So they're falling down on each side. Um, and yeah, she just looks beautiful. Yeah. And sh can you imagine like, that she was like considered to be one of the most beautiful people in the, 20 in the 1920s decade? She is. She mm -hmm. is very beautiful. Um, she has, it looks like her skin is not, I guess, like a... I can see how they would pass her off as white mm -hmm. because she has fair looking skin um, yeah. and nice looking nose, cheekbones and everything. She has a really nice bone structure in yeah. her face. So like, what do you think about like Hollywood pretty much putting her into white roles despite her not being white? I mean, back then they didn't really want anybody. I'm surprised they even let her work on, on film because back then they didn't really want anybody working unless they were white. Right. They didn't want to portray anybody on film unless they were white. Right. And if you weren't white, you were portrayed as a help or as a slave. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. And even the slaves were portrayed as if they were, like, okay. Like, they loved being their slaves, their master slaves. Yeah. It was so funny to me. Like in Song of the South? Oh, my gosh. No, like in Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind, yeah. 
So I mean, the South was exactly the same too. They were like, "Wow, I like being a slave. Slaves cool." It's exactly the same. But yeah, like some in Gone with the Wind was like that too. But um, to be fair, she, uh, the actress who did play said slave did win an Oscar for her role and was like the first uh, person of color to ever win an Oscar. Yes, and they still would not allow her to sit in the same table with her other cast members when right. she was attending the Oscars. Oh, she yeah. was forced to sit in a table by herself, way in the bag, by the kitchen. Right. That really stinks. But look at it this way. You get closer to the food. First one to get the food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's still not cool. You, should, you need to hang out with your, with your fellow castmates. So, like, yeah. So, now in the 1920s, another Mexican actress reached the height of Hollywood stardom, Lupe Velez, who attended high school in San Antonio as a teenager, but returned to Mexico after her family lost their home during the Mexican Revolution. So, the family struggled financially in those years, and Velez moved to Mexico City to work at an FAL department store, then considered an upper-class symbol of modern global capitalism. Her breakthrough occurred when she appeared in a popular musical production of the, in the city's Revista Theater. After moving to the U.S., she made her first film appearance in, the short, uh, in a short in 1927. By the end of the decade, she was acting in full-length silent films and had, and had progressed to leading roles in The Gaucho, Lady of the Pavements, and Wolf Song. So Velez's roles were varied and often portrayed as exotic and foreign women. Ooh. So let's see a photo of uh, Miss Vasquez here. What year is this, you said? Uh, this is uh, 1920, like 1929 or 1928. Okay, there she is. Oh, wow, she's so pretty too. Mm -hmm. Lupe Velez. Yeah, Lupe Velez. Velez. Um... So she is, this is another black and white photo. Yeah. And where she's wearing, I love this outfit. It's so like in that time period, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, has the broad shoulders, the padded shoulders, it's a blazer. And it looks like it's kind of made out of a, like a thick material. And then she has like a hat on that's like a fuzzy kind of top hat, but it doesn't have a rim on it. I guess, mm -hmm. what would you call those hats? Those are like fez-like hats. Yeah. And then she has a cigarette, but she has one of those like elegant cigarette holders, the yeah. black long ones where you would put your cigarette on. Yeah. Uh, I know everybody used to smoke back then. And then she has like shoulder length, really curly hair. Yeah, shoulder length, curly hair brunette of course brown hair um it looks a little bit you know wavy as well mm -hmm. um and shoulder length, so yeah yeah so yeah so she was another very prominent figure in uh in uh mexican hollywood or hollywood mexicans in hollywood uh so yeah, so let's continue. So like through Hollywood, though Hollywood had two Mexican star actresses in the 1920s and a male star who is uh, Ramon Navarro, there was still controversy over the stereotypical, stereotypical depictions of Latin Americans in film. In the 1920s, Latin America was Hollywood's biggest export market. So in Mexico, nearly 80% of all films screened were made in the United States. Nevertheless, Mexicans and other Latin Americans were often depicted on screen as lazy, barbaric, morally degenerate, or buffoonish. So what do you think about that? That sounds like there was a narrative there. Mm. <laughs> So, Mexican Americans already facing an onslaught of discrimination in other aspects of their everyday lives were concerned that such depictions, depictions were contributing to the prejudicial treatment they were receiving in the United States. Spanish language newspapers criticized Hollywood greaser films depiction of Latin Americans and even called the Mexican government to take a stand against Hollywood. 
The Mexican government did launch an influence campaign, but its success was limited. According to one historian, the Mexican immigrant community in Los Angeles used discussions about cinema to critique American racial and political ideologies. So what do you think about this whole issue? I'm glad they were taking a stand. I'm glad they were doing something. You know, throughout the generations, there's always been the group of people that just can't not do anything. Like, they actually do something. And um, I'm glad to see that it's gotten better and better. Mm -hmm. You know, it's grown. So what do you think about Hollywood? Like, do you think this is still pretty prominent today? Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's... It's changed definitely throughout the generations, um, it, but it kind of seems like we have these same conversations again, you know, where they're not, um, you know, displaying an LGBTQ, you know, person the correct way. I mean, we still see that today with, you know, when they want to portray lesbian relationships, there always has to have some kind of, you know, steamy sex scene in there, you know, and it's just not portrayed like in other ways that other heterosexual relationships are portrayed. Um, same with disabled people, you know, people that have mental disabilities or even physical disabilities. Um, there's whitewashing still where there's like a film that is supposed to be Chinese and they have an all white crew or cast members that are white instead of the actual you know, race. So I think, I think we still have those conversations today and it sucks, but, um, I feel like it is getting better. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, a filmmaker of color, where'd you go? <laughs> oh, there you are. So I think like a filmmaker of color has actually won best director. I think like for 10 years in a row or like eight years in a row. What do you mean? What did you say? I said uh, a, a filmmaker, of, a person of color won best, the best director Oscar like like eight or ten years in a row in the Oscars. Who was it? Well, last year it was Chloe Zhao, um, who, who is Chinese, and she won for uh, Nomadland, remember? Oh, right. And then it was the guy from Parasite, right? Yeah, yeah. Jun Bung Ho Previously. won. Yeah. For uh, for Parasite, and uh, and then before that, I know it was Alejandro Giannuritu won it twice in a row. Uh, Guillermo del Toro. Yeah, but a lot won. of people are saying that that's because there has been those movements um, mm. where they've been calling Hollywood out. They've been calling the Oscars, the actual Academy, out. Mm -hmm. They were saying that the Oscars were racist, and so now people are like, "Oh, they're just giving it to them because of that." Well, I don't know. Come on, man. If you if you're in that if you're that mindset, then then there's no winning. That's what I'm saying. I mean, they're, they're actually now being respected and actually recognized for their work. Is mm -hmm. what I feel like. I feel like that too. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so we're gonna move on from Hollywood, and we're gonna go. Okay, into... so I'm gonna. What what year were you gonna go into? Because I have. Something. Uh, I was gonna go back a little bit into like 1910 and then go into like 1923. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so in the 1920s, Mexican met Mexicans met an increasing demand for cheap labor in the West Coast. So Mexican refugees continued to migrate to areas outside of the Southwest. So they were recruited to work in the steel mills of Chicago during a strike in 1910, 1919, and again in 1923. So many found work. So because they were, because the workers were on strike, they yeah. replaced them with the Mexican immigrants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So many found work on the assembly lines of automobile factories in Detroit and in the meat plants of Chicago and Kansas City. So many also worked as agricultural laborers, laborers in farming valleys and in the border states such as Tucson in Arizona and the Rio Grande Valley in Texas and most especially the Imperial Valley in California. Anglo-Americans hired Mexicans and Mexican-Americans to work on the region's year-round agricultural economy. 
Mexican farm laborers, uh, along with African Americans, Filipino Americans, Japanese Americans, and even Armenian Americans, Punjabi Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Native Americans were instrumental in California becoming the nation's top agricultural state. So it was all thanks to us immigrants. It was all the immigrants. Mm -hmm. Thanks to the immigrants, you yeah. guys have food. Absolutely, and it was like a, it was like a, a joint effort between all the different uh, immigrant communities to help propel uh, California to such a, like a agricultural powerhouse. Yeah. And I hope that there were those bonds that formed, you know, in between those cultures, and they got to, you know, see a bit of each other's cultures, and you know, just become more knowledgeable and educated on other people. Yeah, that's the beauty of America, man. You get to be, like, surrounded by so many different people from different places and different, like, aspects and knowledge about different parts of life, which is really, really cool and interesting. So, in this shift toward agricultural dominance, California relied on sheep labor of Mexicans and Mexican-Americans in a wide variety of fields. By the mid-1920s, California cotton farms were around five times larger than the farms of the Deep South. This meant they needed large numbers of manual laborers as well as technicians since California farmers adopted tractors and picking machines at rates faster than any other region. So the ability of a Mexican laborers to adapt to industrial farming was crucial into the uh, state's success. Nevertheless, even as labor unions in the 1920s grew rapidly to protect workers, some mainstream organizations such as the AFL were blatantly anti-Mexican. So when Mexicans sought, their working sought better working conditions, they often faced outright violence. So what do you think about that? I think it's they're shitting on them over and over again, no matter how much they say they need them. Yeah. So even like even the uh, the unions that were supposed to help workers when it comes to Af Mexican Americans, they're like, yeah, we shut we shut up. Yeah. So it's like we're the only ones. The immigrants are the only ones who are willing to work under those conditions for that you know amount of pay that they're giving them. Mm-hmm. So, some of the decade's most infamous labor disputes occurred in Colorado. In 1927, Mexican-American coal miners participated in a bloody coal strike in Colorado, walking out under the banner of the industrial workers of the world. <coughs> Mexican-Americans in the southeastern part of the state, particularly from uh, Walsenburg, Pueblo, and Trinidad areas, took leadership roles in 1927 strike protest protesting for better and safer working conditions some mine workers in other parts of the state uh retaliated against the striking miners by refusing to hire any mexican or Amer mexican americans in their mines yeah good luck with that yeah who else did they hire <laughs> yeah in wessenberg in trinidad the mine where owners went to more extreme measures to st stimmy the protests uh, or yeah stimmy the protests mine were owners uh yeah mine owners hired armed men to attack the IWW's Trinidad Hall in Wessenburg branch halls in Walsenburg the men used a machine gun to attack the IWW hall ultimately killing two union strikers uh Celestino Martinez who was 15 years old and Clement and uh, Clemence Chavez who was 41 on January 12th 1928 it looks like they're using that same method that they have I guess you they've, they've seen it used as an example before by their founding fathers mm -hmm. and they're just like well we're just gonna go and bully them out bully them to stop and sh kill them if necessary mm -hmm. which i don't see the logic in that it's like you're killing the workers that you need mm -hmm. and also like what do you think about them like killing a teenager and a middle-aged man that's like the worst thing about it, you know, it's like he's 15, he still had a whole life ahead of him, and 
it's just tragic. Mm-hmm. It's very tragic. Yeah. So Josephine Roche, uh, president of the Rocky Mountain Fuel Company, invited the United Mine Workers of America to unionize her mines so as to meet some of the strikers' demands without alienating other mine owners who remain strongly opposed to the IWW. So in 1929, the League of United Latin American Citizens was formed in Corpus Christi. Uh, Through the emerging of several smaller Mexican-American organizations, it was one of the nation's first mainstream Mexican-American political organizations and was formed largely through the efforts of Mexican-American World War I veterans who were frustrated at the continued discrimination of Mexican-Americans faced in the United States. So Ben Garza served as the organization's first president. LULAC quickly developed into an influential middle-class civil rights organization with councils across the Southwest. Organization members tended to portray themselves as patriotic white Americans, and membership was restricted only to English-speaking U.S. citizens. All right, so what do you think about that? LULAC is now here. Lulek is still here. Yeah. So they've, they've done a lot of great work, especially for immigrants. Yeah. But right now they're only, uh, they're only adding only Mexican, like English speaking Americans in this point. Yeah. I mean, that was the start, I guess. But <laughs> like I said, I think they've grown a lot, mm-hmm. a lot more. Mm-hmm. So like the N. The NAACP at this time, LULAC believed an educated elite Mexican-American leadership would guide the community uh, as a whole toward higher political and economic standing in the United States. Nevertheless, the organization focused mostly on issues such as voter registration and poll tax fundraising drives, aggressively waging legal campaigns against racially discriminatory laws and practices. So, yeah, that's pretty much what LULAC is doing right now. Um, so that is well, we're end it, uh, today. Okay. we well, just real quick. Um, it, I had some stuff that just going on in Mexico. Yeah. So in 1934, mm-hmm. um, you know, cause last Obregón was, was reelected, but he was killed. So now we have Lázaro Cardenas, who was another former revolutionary general. So you see kind of like this pattern where Mexico's presidents during this time were several like generals, you know, like army generals that Mm -hmm. came to step in as president. Um, So yeah, so we have Cardenas as the newly elected president. Um, He also revives the revolutionary era social revolution in Mexico. And he he, uh, redistributes nearly twice as much land to peasants as had all of his previous predecessors combined. So he was the one that gave even more back, you know, to the poor. Right. And um, he was there up until 1938. Um, he, Cardenas, he nationalizes the country's oil industry and creates a government agency to administer the oil industry. Um, he remains a very influential leader in the government for the next three decades. So we have the era of Cardenas in Mexico going on right now, which seems to be fairly well. Awesome. At that point. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so a little bit of a recap of today's uh, thing about the 1920s. What, what do we learn so far? What do we think about the 1920s? We learned that the Ku Klux Klan was trying to take over all of the United States, political-wise as well. Mm-hmm. And they were scaring people, trying to get the Mexicans out. Mm-hmm. Trying to scare the Mexicans out. Yeah. Um, we also learned that there are a lot of uh, groups, organizations, grassroots organizations that are taking form in defense for the community. Mm-hmm. So that's a, that's a good thing. Yeah. And then Hollywood came into town. And then Hollywood came into town mm-hmm. with all of their mishaps. Uh, if you want to learn about all the crazy side stories of Hollywood, I'm sure you could find several videos of that on YouTube because oh, yeah. we're not going to go into that. Oh, yeah. Hollywood <laughs> is its own crazy, crazy beast. So next time we're going to try to go into the Great Depression and see if we can also get into a little bit of World War II. 
but yeah, tomorrow we're definitely going to, not tomorrow, but the next time we're definitely going to go into the Great Depression and see how Mexican-American history affected in that time period. Uh, so yeah, that, that's been pretty okay. good. So I think we learned quite a bit today about the, about definitely how labor unions are affected, how we kind of attribute it to very, uh, like contributed to a lot of economic growth, but we're kind of given the short end of the stick and everything and still. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're still not recognized. We're not recognized. We're not respected. Mm -hmm. But now we're starting to have like now we're having like actual uh, pretty established uh, organizations and activism, which is finally coming into play that isn't like going anywhere anytime soon. And they very they made themselves well, like well known that they're not going anywhere and that they can't be squashed by just like hard brute force. So, yeah, so because that's what they like to do. Mm hmm. So yeah, you cannot kill a revolutionary. Mm -hmm. You can kill the man, but you can't kill the idea. Yeah. Yeah. You, did you remember that line in uh, Judas and the Black Messiah? Yeah. Oh. I also remember it was uh, Fred Hampton who said that. Oh, okay. Hey, Ruby, I am a revolutionary. A revolutionary. I am a revolutionary. A revolutionary. Yeah, that's a good movie. Check it out. Yeah, that was a great film. It. So yeah, that w that was the story of hist the of the nineteen twenties so far, and we'll go on uh, next time. And I've been Nathaniel Avila. And I am Ruby Rodriguez. And we'll see you guys next Thank time. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for class, children. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to a Vision podcast, home of wacky talkies. The kingdom, evil exists, and many more.